I think I'm going to need like a summer podcasting hat because it's already hot with the lights. You know, this thing, <laughs> it doesn't have a lot of ventilation. Okay. It doesn't have a lot of ventilation and I'm having a bad hair day. And ever since I told the world that I cut my own hair, I feel like my hair always needs to be on point, but I don't like hair. <laughs> Y'all don't come here to look at me. Y'all come here to listen to stories, experience, advice. All right. So let's get on with that. Hey, hey, party people. Today, I want to talk about how to start your fashion career. And first of all, I timed it because I was reminded that so many people are graduating from their fashion school programs this time of year. But that doesn't necessarily mean that this is only for fashion school grads, right? This is for anybody who is starting their fashion career. Okay, let's take a second. Regardless of your opinions on fashion schools, please join me in giving our new grads a round of applause for all of their hard work and their sacrifice and their dedication to get this really, this really tough degree. Okay, dork moment over, all right? Um, Not really. The first thing you should do once you graduate fashion school is to celebrate yourself. Like, have you actually paused and been like, I did that. You know, did you watch your senior show? I'm like, I did that. Okay, take a moment and just soak it in and celebrate yourself. Go party. Okay, (laughs) go party. And sleep. When I graduated, I slept so much, my dad actually asked me, is there something wrong with you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm recovering. (laughs) I slept a lot. Uh, The the other thing I did is um, it was the World Cup that summer, and uh, Korea, South Korea, and Japan were co-hosting the World Cup that year. And so let me tell you something about South Korean nationalism. It's a double-edged sword, and South Korean nationalism can be a very scary thing. Like, how do you think that, you know, war-torn Korea, like, I mean, talk about a phoenix rising from its ashes to, you know, what it, how the modernized country it is today. I mean, nationalism powered that. Nationalism powered that. Of course, I was living in Koreatown in LA at the time. And so the whole town was lit with watch parties. And because of the time difference, these games were on at like one in the morning. And so, yeah, we were out. And these parties were great because they were multi-generational parties. You were not too old or too young to appreciate Koreans doing anything on a global scale. Okay. And so we would go and there would be like guys my dad's age with these big traditional Korean drums, banging them in the actual way you're supposed to bang those drums. (laughs) And little kids running around every like people of all ages drinking soju and cheering. And oh my God, I I still remember after we would win games, like people would be cruising Third Street like it was Sunset Boulevard and their girls would be on the backs of trucks waving massive South Korean flags. It was, it was, it was fun. It was super fun. But yeah, go party, go get your sleep, go take a vacation, all the good things that bring you joy and happiness and rejuvenation. Okay, number two, This is the time to really think about what you want moving into your career. And I mean, I'm sure you had some thoughts stirring as you were taking your classes, as you were, you know, maybe taking lessons on the internet, going to fashion school, thinking about this career change in your life, but really think about what you want. And I think that there's this like misconception that everyone who studies fashion design wants to end up like Tom Ford, Mucha Prada, and, you know, be this like rich, famous, you know, running fashion empires. I mean, listen, Mucha Prada didn't even want what Mucha Prada has. Okay. She was studying political science when, you know, she was dragged back to her family business luggage. And then she put out that first nylon bag in the 90s, okay? So anyway, the point is, don't do anything because you think it will make you look cool to anyone else. Your work will show whether you are really designing from your true aesthetic soul 
than just faking it so that you can look a particular way in front of your friends, family, what have you. If you want to run a nonprofit um, where you're helping women uh, get jobs with sewing skills and you run a sewing factory and you're giving them like fair wages and that's the kind of business you want to run, amazing. If you want a quieter life and just make cute stuff, small scale and run a small business, also great. And listen, I have a lot of friends who do this, but if you just want to go into the office and clock in and design some cute stuff, draw some flats in Illustrator, play with fabrics, have design meetings over what buttons are needed for this, and then just clock out because fashion is a job you enjoy, but it's not your lifeblood, that's perfectly fine. That's the majority of the industry anyway, okay? Like, it doesn't have to be the thing that consumes your whole mind, body, and soul. That's perfectly okay. I have a lot of friends who are like this. They don't want to deal with none of the business stuff. None of it. They are so absolutely disinterested in taxes, import, export, sourcing, managing people. They don't want none of that. They want to come in and make cute dresses and think about proportions, think about colorways that are trending, those kinds of things, and then go home. And you might want that too. Nothing wrong with that. Be honest with yourself about what you want in life. And here's the thing. It doesn't have to be a forever decision. They say that the average adult changes career course, you know, the direction of their career, seven times before retirement. I think I'm on course three, okay? The first was uh, years in a straightforward design career, and then I shifted to university teaching, and now I am doing this. <laughs> three, you probably wanna find a job, so let's talk about that, how to do that. Number one, your alma mater should absolutely be helping you find a job. Some schools are definitely better about this than others. My school, my alma mater, Otis College of Art and Design, um, they are very concerned with helping alma mater find jobs. I am subscribed to Otis's uh, email newsletter for graduates and they still have like job searching events, networking events, things like that. You know, schools do have job boards. If you're at the stage where you're still looking for your dream fashion school, you should be asking the admissions department, what do you do to help students find jobs after they graduate or even internships while they're at school? That's part of their job. And if they're like, oh, you know, when I was when I was touring grad schools with my friend Susie, so Susie is a really good girlfriend of mine. When my writer dies, we went to fashion school together. And last year she decided she wanted to go to grad school and she wanted to study more like sustainability in fashion and change kind of like the direction of her career that way. And so she, we went touring grad schools in Europe and I ask them each time, like, what do you do to help students find jobs once they are done with your program? And one student, one school was like, well, you know, the students should be, you know, taking charge on that front and make, and they should be putting in the work. We're not going to hand them a job. It's like, yeah, we know. We don't expect you to hand us a job, but we, if we could be told of opportunities, you know, where there's some job listings and it's our responsibility to put together a good resume, put together a good portfolio and make a good impression at the interview. Yeah, that's that's the student's job. Your job is to let us know about if there are any openings because you're the school. You know more knowledge about the industry. You have more connections within the industry. You should be like a central sort of go hub for opportunities for your students to don't you want your students to find jobs after school or do you not give, okay, now I'm getting into rant mode, but you know what I mean, right? Another school actually listed partnerships they had with various you know, fashion related companies 
you know, whether they were on the making side or the selling side, you know, it's like, oh, we have great relationships with this company and that company. And when they have openings, we send them. And I'm like, great, that sounds great because they're actually making that effort. So talk to people, talk to the admissions people, you know, talk to your student services, ask them if they have a job board, things like that. Number two, you do have to make an online portfolio. And I don't really want to hear the whole link, but Zoe, people are going to steal my ideas, okay? Listen, if your ideas are good, they're just going to get stolen no matter what you do with it. And the only thing you can do is be like Alexander McQueen and just make more cool stuff. That's what he used to say in interviews. It's like, people copy all the time. I'm like, yeah, I know. I just, I don't have time for that. I just go out and make more cool stuff. And that's the advice I have for you. Now, if you're super paranoid, you can password protect your online portfolio. And when you submit emails, cover letters, etc., to people, then you can say, this is the link to my online portfolio and here's the password. Okay, you can do that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I think that this, this kind of death grip, you're just going to lose sleep. Okay, thinking about the what ifs, okay? Um, wait till you actually have a situation where someone steals something and then hire a lawyer. Of course you need a resume. And listen, I have a video on how to find a fashion job and there, I go over things in more detail in that video. Also the portfolio, honestly, like go to youtube.com and there's the search bar and just put in a portfolio Zoe Hong. And my portfolio videos come right up. I, I just tried it literally before I started filming, so do that. But yeah, you do need a resume. And the number one advice, and this is key top any industry resume advice I have for you. Standard resume formats are going to be different for every country. Like some countries expect you to send in your headshot. The U.S. does not. And some expect you to have your date of birth on there. And in the U.S., it's illegal for them to ask you how old you are. So, right, every country, but here's the one key thing that I think is universal. Do not send out your one resume to everyone, just pass them out like they're like concert flyers. Every time you apply for a job, you should tailor, you know, your template resume to fit that particular job you know, highlight specific job experiences and school experiences and volunteering experiences that will match more closely with what that position is looking for. Especially with big companies, big fashion corporate companies like The Gap or whatever, they are not, like, humans are not reading individual resumes. They are running them through a machine to scan for keywords. And so when you're looking at that job listing, go ahead and lift phrases that they are looking for and put them in your resume so that the resume scanner is picking up on all the keywords they are looking for. But regardless, like, the key is to tailor every single resume specifically. If you have a very blanket, bland resume, people are going to be able to tell. Okay, It's like, oh, this is just like a random, I want an assistant designer's job, but it's not like, even like they read our listing. Next, you need to network like crazy. Okay, Whether it's online, meeting new people, joining fashion communities, like getting into that fashion Twitter stuff and making friends or going to local events and, you know, actually talking to people, you need to network. And the next thing is going to piss a lot of people off, but here's what it is. You need to move to a fashion capital if you're not already in one. And the big ones, of course, are New York, London, Milan, and Paris. But even if you don't go to those four cities, there are other cities that are known for their fashion scene and having a significant amount of fashion industry within that city. You know, uh, Tokyo, Seoul, Shanghai, Copenhagen, like there are other cities where there's a, you know, a big enough fashion scene where there's enough reputation in that city where people are going there for their fashion weeks. You know, do a little Googling is to see like what fashion center is closest to you or most accessible to you. And yeah, is this something not everyone can do? Absolutely. Okay. I'm aware. 
I'm not saying you need to do this for your career, but it will it help a lot? Yes. Okay. If you're looking for a fashion job and you're like in North Dakota where there are not very many fashion jobs and you're like, why can't I find a fashion job? That's because their jobs aren't there. Okay. The jobs aren't there. So you need to go somewhere where there are fashion jobs, where there's networking events to even attend to start networking. Also, and this goes hand in hand, make a LinkedIn profile and clean up your social media. Okay. If you cannot stop yourself from posting drunken selfies on the internet, at least start a professional Instagram where, you know, you have cute pictures of your work in progress, snaps of your portfolio, and then, you know, more like family friendly photos of you having fun, like bicycling in the park, having a picnic with your friends, barbecuing with your family, and, you know, not so much the drunken selfies. All right. Um, if you need to keep those two things separate, but I'm, I'm old school and, uh, I did not grow up with social media. Like I joined Friendster in college or maybe just after college. Who remembers Friendster? <laughs> it was before MySpace. Okay. Um, like LinkedIn is the new dark horse of social media. LinkedIn and Pinterest kind of, it's kind of funny how they're overlooked, but they're becoming more prominent over time. But LinkedIn is good. You know, there are a lot of fashion companies there. You know, I see like Dior doing their live runway shows, like live streaming on LinkedIn, people, fashion companies posting job opportunities on LinkedIn. You know, you want to find kind of the hiring managers of companies, contact them. You know, I did an interview with Melissa Kalamia and she's a fashion designer. And we go over a lot of how she first got her first fashion jobs. And she went to school here in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And then she moved out to New York when she found a job out in New York. And we talk a lot about that whole process. And I'll link that below if you want to watch it. But yeah, create a LinkedIn profile, put your resume, you know, start interacting and, you know, list your skills, ask people to like, what is it when they plus one on, yeah, she's good at this skill and you leave testimonials, like professional testimonials, like hands down the best illustrator of our graduating class, you know, all those kinds of things and really build up that professional presence. And so that when you are contacting hiring managers, they see that you have all these skills and people are vouching for that. I love when I'm in the middle of shooting a video and I'm like, do I have something stuck in my teeth? Okay, next up, get an internship. And listen, if you've been following me for any length of time, you know how much I despise free internships, okay? I just, I hate them so much. Listen, here's the thing. If you are doing everything by yourself, okay, and you decided you're gonna start making some cute aprons, and you are designing and producing some cute aprons, you're a one woman show, and your niece is like, oh, you know, can I come work for you for the summer and put you on a resume, put, you know, put you on my resume, and you're like, um, I ain't got no money to pay you. And your niece comes in a couple of times a week, you feed her lunch every time, and you give her rides to and fro, and she comes in and helps you. Like, that kind of free internship is like, listen, okay? That's different from when Marc Jacobs, and what's the underwear line Rihanna does when companies like that say they won't pay their interns? That's different. That's different, okay? Like, <laughs> you don't think a company like Marc Jacobs, like, they could flip open the couch and find a couple grand for a summer intern in the couch. Okay. Like they, they always say like the prestige of having our name on your resume should be payment enough or some BS like that. It is BS. You want to know why? Here's why. The only people who can work those internships are people who are already getting their bills paid by someone else. So people who are coming from money, some kind of established money. And 
Therefore, the only like the best opportunities are only available for people who already have the means, who already are probably connected. You know, in this day and age where we're all ringing out for like nepo babies' heads, like I can't believe free internships are still a thing. It's like if you have a free internship, you're basically advertising the fact that we only want to hire people who can afford to already be here. That mom and dad are paying their rent, and so they don't need to work for money. You're advertising that you are not hiring the best and the brightest, because the best and the brightest could be a rich person, also could be someone who really needs to work for money and cannot participate in this free opportunity. And they're going to keep working at Starbucks until they find a proper job because they have bills. And so you want to talk about what's wrong with the fashion industry? The fashion, what's wrong with the fashion industry is it's run by rich, privileged children who got the jobs because they had a list of prestigious free internships, unpaid internships, on their resume. And then the next company was like, "Look at their prestigious pr- previous internships." They must be amazing. Let's hire them, as opposed to this one who worked at Starbucks for three years. So you get a bunch of. Again, I'm going into rant mode, but yeah, that's why I hate unpaid internships, especially from companies who clearly have the budget to pay their summer interns. Okay, I mean, usually most internships are three months anyway. Like, you can't scruff up a few grand for three months. And then people are like, "What? You can't work for free for three months?" Um, have you lived in any of these fashion capitals or any of these major cities where there are fashion jobs? Do you understand cost of living? Don't talk to me. Anyway, that's different from one-time, you know, volunteering. Like, if someone's having a show and they need volunteers, and you go and you volunteer backstage, and then you network and get a free drink kit. Doing the occasional event is not going to stop you from paying your bills, like having actual job to pay your bills. So, like event volunteering, I think is a great opportunity for people, but not like anywhere where you're expected to be there regularly for you know most of the day, you know anything like that. Hey y'all, no from the editor. It's Zoe. I am the editor. I edit all my videos. Anyway, I got off track a little bit. Basically, yeah. Take whatever internship opportunity that you can. If you can afford to work for free for three months, do it. If you can find a paid internship, do it. You know, you should not feel guilty for taking these opportunities. It's really the fault of the company offering these unpaid internships. It's not on you to change this. It's on the companies to change their practices and stop offering、uh, unpaid internships. And in a perfect world. You know, all students could stop taking these unpaid internships, and then the companies would be like, "Oh, we don't have any interns, and what have you, right?" But it's not on you; it's on the companies. And so, go ahead and take the opportunities that you can. And the next is, I'm putting myself out there like crazy, but I can't find a job. Now what? You're gonna have to do your own thing. It might not be forever, but you're gonna have to do your own thing. Freelance. Start your own product line, start making stuff. You know, do that project you couldn't do in school because your teacher didn't like it, and you were afraid you were gonna flunk if you didn't please the teacher. Now, am I saying that this is a good thing? No. Am I saying it happens in fashion schools everywhere? Yes. Okay. But if you had that project you were had a burning desire to do, and your teacher was like,、eh, "Go do that project. Go finish that project and put it on your portfolio." Okay. Set up a store and start making things. I had a student who liked making socks. It was like. Her stress activity, like anytime she was nervous, anytime her fr- hands were available, anytime she was on public transport, she was always making socks, and she made a lot of cute socks. And then after school, she started selling her socks. She didn't do it for very long, but she really enjoyed it. If you have something like that, just start doing it, and it doesn't even have to be forever. But first of all, the experience of making something. Pricing it and selling it and working with customers and shipping like these are things that are just really invaluable experience down the line. Okay, 
And you're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to learn whether you like running a business. You're going to learn if you still like the products that you're making. You're going to, you're going to learn a lot about yourself in try. And if you run a company for a year and then you get a job later, wonderful, whatever you have that on your resume that you had, you built your own business and you were selling this stuff. Will it blow up? Maybe. Okay. Who knows? But you need to do your own thing. Okay. Also, you probably need to find some other kind of job and that's fine too. Maybe you want to be a freelance illustrator and put your uh, work up on Behance or grow your Instagram following and, you know, really plug into the social media world and grow your presence and, you know, become well known to be an illustrator. Maybe that was your strength in fashion school. And so, but you need to be doing something. Okay, you might get a job as an admin at whatever company to tide you over on bills in the meantime, but I want you to be doing something else, at least part time. And the key thing here is to be brave. When you are fresh in the fashion world, whether you are changing careers now or you've just finished fashion school, all you've got is a little bit of knowledge in your head and a spine, grit, energy and bravery. And bravery is not an absence of fear. It is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Go do the thing. Try the freelance thing. Try the social media thing. Try making your own product. You are going to learn so much. You're going to put yourself out there. You're going to have experiences. And the things that you learn from those experiences are absolutely things you cannot learn in school. If there was one thing I could tell my younger self in the beginning of my career, it would have been to be more bold, more brave. Mistakes are not as permanent as you think they are. Be brave, be bold. Today's story time is not that fun, but it is extremely relevant to the topic at hand. So I'm going to share it with you anyway. And it did take me a little bit of time for me to be really public about this because it was very embarrassing for me. And now I'm kind of at that stage where I just share all of my embarrassing failures. Um, I've told so many people about how the first time I tried Patreon, it failed miserably. And now my Patreon is much better, but that first time was not great, but it's fine. I learned a lot. Things are better now. However, I'm going to tell you about the one time I got fired. <sighs> this was when I had first moved to San Francisco from Los Angeles and uh, I needed a job. I needed to pay bills. I needed whatever job I could find. And so I did find a job as an admin at a very small family run business. It was a married couple and just three people they hired and one was part time. Okay. And I went in there and, you know, here's the thing with these small family businesses. I'm not about to talk smack about small family businesses, except this one regard. Okay. Sometimes they can get a little casual. Sometimes things can just be like, I said this and you said this and we shook on it or things like that. And things are not written. You know, these big corporations, they, they make these like HR manuals that are like 120 pages, things like that. And then family, these small family businesses can be like the exact opposite where there's like no written standard, but if you mess up, you're going to pay for it somehow, even though you didn't really know the parameters of, you get what I'm saying, right? So basically what happened is I was hired by this company to replace their admin who was moving away to go to grad school. And they're like, oh, she is going to explain the job to you and you just do whatever she says to do. And I said, great. And we spent the week together and I shadowed her and she told me everything that I needed to do. And then instead of staying the whole week, she stayed for three days and then took off. And I was like, okay. And so I just kept doing the things she put me to task on. There was no formal, uh, responsibilities list. Like a couple weeks in, I got fired because I didn't do all the things that she had done, which I was not aware I had to do. And as there was no like list where I can be like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do that at some point. I got to get on that. Like there was nothing like that. Everything was so informal. I didn't sign an employee contract. Everything was just like, yeah, and we're going to cut you a check and blah, blah, blah. It was like, too informal. 
we're family. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, if you want to borrow our cabin in Tahoe, just let us know. Like it was very like, we're family. We're good vibes. You know, you cannot run a company on vibes. So they fired me and I was indignant. I'm like, I didn't even know I was supposed to do that. And I got fired for not doing it. F you. Uh, in retrospect, it was probably a good thing I left because they watched a lot of Fox News. Like they had the TV on all the time and they watched a lot of Fox News. So, <laughs> but anyway, the lesson, the moral of the story is even if you go work for a small family owned company where it's all good vibes and you really feel like you trust everyone there, don't, don't, okay? Get things in writing, sign an employee contract that lists the things that you are responsible for. So you can CYA, cover your butt, um, push comes to shove. So that everyone is on the same page about what you are responsible for. So you know to do that, okay? Um, and get your salary, your benefit, everything should be written out signed by all parties, and then you can go back to your good vibes. You can go back to your small family, good vibes, super cash atmosphere, but get that in writing, okay? You get that stuff official, and then go back to having happy, slappy, good times with the rest of the crew. It is hot. My curls have just flattened all the way from the heat in here. I can't run the AC while recording. Are you kidding? <sighs> Today's rant is going to be creator rants, things I hate about being a creator. And <sighs> this rant was inspired by the fact that I had to wait for my phone to charge its battery before I could start recording because I wanted to plug it into this lovely mic you see before you so that my qu sound quality can be better because I live in a noisy neighborhood and my iPhone only has one hole. Who thought that was a good idea? I didn't. I didn't ask for that. Okay, you think I was upset because there was a second hole in my phone? Of all the things to be upset at my phone about, you thought I was upset about a second hole, okay? And so anytime I wanna do anything, plug anything in, I have to make sure my battery is 100% charged before I do anything, okay? That is annoying. And you know, I'm sure some of you are at home thinking, oh my God, are you still filming everything on your phone, Zoe? Get a real camera. No, I don't wanna get a real camera because first of all, my iPhone works just fine because if you didn't realize I was shooting on an iPhone until I told you I was shooting on an iPhone, then obviously I don't need a new camera. Second of all, let me tell you something. This is one of the best pieces of advice that I have ever received, especially in the beginning of my creator career that I pass on to everyone because I think it applies for nearly every industry. Okay. And that, that advice was get the best piece of technology that won't stop you from still creating. Okay, and she told me about how um, she was talking to this food blogger and how she had this like little whatever throw around camera and she started taking pictures of her food and her Instagram was blowing up and all this stuff. And her husband, in order to support her career, had bought her this super fancy camera. And I understand this is a very sweet thing that he did. I am not you know, think I'm not pooping on this guy at all whatsoever, but he got her this really fancy camera. It had all these buttons and gizmos and, you know, flashy thingies. And she just was discouraged because she was trying to learn how to read them. It was so annoying for her that she lost interest and stopped producing. And when, long story short, she went back to her old camera they sold the fancy camera, they upgraded her camera, but not like such a huge difference in technology. And she gradually grew into better equipment. But if you are like sitting there, like letting technology, money, equipment, stop you from doing the thing, I'm always telling people like, Everyone loves Copics, but they're like $9 a pop and you don't even know how to use markers yet. Go for something more moderate like Prismacolor, Blick Studio brand. They are far more reasonably priced. Their quality is very good. Go practice on cheaper markers where you're not gonna be too scared to like make a stroke and all of a sudden your markers are dried out before you can even use them, all right? 
Do not buy fancy, expensive paintbrushes until you've already ruined a couple of bad ones. All right, build up to that. I started making videos on my iPhones and I graduated iPhones, but I never felt a reason to get a better camera or like a big DSLR. So I don't care, that's not my rant. My rant is I need tools in my phone, okay? And I know what y'all were thinking, y'all need to stop being dirty, you know what I mean, all right? Rant number two, okay? The camera adds 10 pounds to my body and removes 10 pounds of makeup from my eyes. Hey, do you know how much eye makeup I'm wearing right now? You don't because it's a little bit hidden by my glasses and also because the light like eats my eyeshadow like it's lunch. Like if you see me and you think I'm wearing just like a sliver of eyeliner, trust me, I am not, okay? It just the lights ate it all. Okay, this whole, it's like a very precarious, like I cannot go out of the house wearing video makeup because I look comical. I look comical. <laughs> Rant number three, if I had a dollar for every time a video game company spam me with an email saying, we want you to run advertising for our game, but it's not even a legitimate offer from a legitimate video company, okay? It really reads like, you know, Prince of Nigeria is holding $8 million for you kind of letter, and I am so over it. Someone put me on a list somewhere and I get so much of the spam every single day. And then, and then Google has the gall to email me and say, huh, you know what? Um, I have uh, um, noticed that uh, you there's been a lot of user reported spam at your domain. I'm like, listen, which, if you were doing your job right, if your spam filters were doing their job right, I wouldn't need to have to report the spam, because you would be filtering it already, but you don't do your job, okay? So I have to do it for you. And while we're on the note of spam, the last thing I would like to say today is we need to find a new word for spam, because spam the food is delicious. I don't care what you think about spam, keep it to yourself, don't yuck my yum. If you don't wanna eat spam, very quietly, do not eat spam in your own home. Me, I love spam. Okay? And so I don't think we should name this disaster thorn in my side, this everyday pestilence, after something I find personally very delicious. Okay, So we should start calling it something else, junk. I mean, I like the word junk. It's being used, but it's not being used enough. Obviously, that is not a priority in my life. I'm just saying, okay, I'm on a roll. And now, you know, sometimes when I'm on a roll, I just decide I'm going to tell everyone about all the things I hate about everything but I'm gonna stop today. <laughs> Do let me know in the comments uh, a topic that you would like me to go over in a future episode of the podcast. Um, and let me know if you want a video on becoming a creator. Uh, please share, subscribe, you know, all the ways you show me love and I will see you in the next video.